going to talk about for you today. I think you've heard a lot of inspirational discussions earlier about finding your path. And I've heard a little bit, I've asked actually a little bit about all of you, and I know that you know, most of you, I think all of you are kind of the, the cream of the crop of your schools. You're the overachievers. You're the ones involved in multiple. Some of you are saying, no, not me. But I know you are. You're being honest. Uh, you're involved in multiple clubs and doing a lot, which I think is, is great. It's like kind of a similar path I have. But what I want to do for you today is I, there's just so much. We only have an hour, um, and I want to do a lot of different things. So the first is I've been asked to talk a little bit about how at age 25 I served in, by, by, by age 25 I served in two White Houses and was getting my PhD at Oxford in this field of substance abuse. Because a lot of people think you know, the only jobs in this field is either um, you kind of be a cop or work in treatment or prevention, but which are all awesome. But there are other opportunities I want to talk to you a little bit about. I also um, just so I'm going to give you a little bit of my life story. And I'm sorry if it's a little boring. I'll, I'll try and speed it up. Um, I want to also talk a little bit about marijuana generally. I know I think marijuana is one of those, if not the most, misunderstood drug that we have going on in the discussion about in America, including the state. And I'm not here to talk about you know. Uh, it's going to ruin your life if you use it once, or reefer madness kind of stuff. But I'm here to talk about the science, just a little bit about it though, because tonight in Lindmar, any people, anyone from Lindmar here? No? Okay. That's all right. Well, a couple of you. Um, we are having a much longer discussion. Bring your parents. Uh, where is it at exactly? At the theater. At the theater. Um, and uh, it's going to be a longer discussion on the science and stuff. And then I want to show you at the end a little 10 minute film, a little 10 minute video that we just put together. You're actually going to be the, the first um, sort of school population that has ever seen it, but we've shown it to a few different groups of adults, but it's brand new. And this film talks about how the tobacco industry essentially tricked your generation, um, and really everybody under 35 right now, so I'm barely fitting under the, so I'm going to pretend I'm like with you guys, 18 or 35 and under. Um, as a 35 and under population uh, for so many years and basically made trillions of dollars in the meantime. And how I'm arguing that we actually have a new industry that's like that, that's trying to do the same thing that Big Tobacco did, except they're now called Big Marijuana. And they're essentially trying to make billions of dollars off of this idea uh, of, of you know, selling marijuana, different marijuana sort of kinds of um, candies and cookies and that kind of thing. So I'm going to talk about that at the end. I think it's a pretty interesting film you're going to like. And then I do want to about 10 to 15 minutes of questions. So that's a lot to do within an hour. So I'm going to start right off the bat. And this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, this is actually from uh, President Theodore Roosevelt. He talks about being in what's called the arena. And he says, uh, it is not the critic who counts, not the one who points out how the strong man stumbled or how the doer of deeds might have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred with sweat and dust and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause, who, if he wants, knows the triumph of high achievement, and who, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. And I think this is kind of the sort of whole thing of the day about sort of finding your own path. It may not be sort of the straight and narrow, and, and you know, you may have, of course, stumbling blocks to get there and defeats all the time. But this is something that I definitely, you know, live by, I try to live by almost every day because it seems like oftentimes in this field of substance abuse, there are defeats. And, and I'm really in this field because uh, when I was about 14 or 15, um, I had some crushing experiences with very, very close friends of mine and people who were, you know, athletes and great at school and, you know, just really nice kids all around who essentially either got in with the wrong crowd or began using alcohol and marijuana thinking that, you know, it was basically, you know, it was fine, it was harmless. And over, over a short amount of time, um, just seeing their grades slip, seeing their friends change and really seeing their personality change and their, their heart change really. Uh, is something that really, really disturbed me. And that's actually why when I was 15, I got involved in exactly the kinds of groups you're all involved in. It was a way that I actually, um, for this, it was a way that I actually uh, uh, sort of kind of processed all this. Now, I had my life story, I thought, all planned out when I was like five. I was just one of those guys, and I, and I know, maybe the minority. I, I sort of knew what I wanted to do. I used to watch, like, we didn't have Judge Judy back then, but sort of other courtroom dramas. I'd be like, I want to be that guy. Um, and, you know, think I'd be a judge and do all this stuff, maybe get into politics, 
kids go to the Ivy League, do all of that. Well, I'll tell you, actually, none of this worked out, by the way, including student body president. I was not student body president. And uh, none of this worked out at all. And um, it was just kind of, but, but I wouldn't change where I am right now for anything. And what it's taught me is, again, that things often don't, don't come out the way you want. I found my passion because of this tragedy that I talked about a minute ago about kind of what was going on with my friends and wanting to process it in some ways. Now, some of my own friends processed it in ways of actually using drugs themselves or getting angry or, or you know, just not really caring about life or caring about school because either their siblings or their, their best friends were sort of having all these problems and they didn't know how to deal with it. I dealt with it in a way that essentially I wanted to get involved in drug policy and prevention. I asked the question, and I grew up in an upper middle class household in Southern California, 10 minutes from Disneyland, where these kinds of stories were really swept under the rug. I mean, and I think that's the case, whether it's rural, suburban, or urban, is that oftentimes it's much easier not to talk about things like substance abuse or mental illness also. Uh, and you know, people just want to pretend that everything's fine. Does that sound familiar to some of you? Yeah. I mean, it's a lot easier to just kind of ignore some of the problems going on in the community. And I, didn't, I just didn't want to ignore them. I'm not the kind of person that ignores. And so, um, you know, I, and, and a lot of people didn't like what I was doing, and they thought it was, and even some of my friends thought it was annoying. They thought it was, why am I getting involved in this issue? Why do I care about substance abuse so much? Uh, I remember confronting our student body president. I was a freshman, he was a senior at, in high school, and asking, why for Red Ribbon Week are all they do, all that's going on is putting on, putting red ribbons around the school? Why is there nothing about factual information about what smoking or alcohol or other drugs actually do to your body? Because it's nice to do the red ribbons thing, and I'm not saying that's bad, and I told them that's fine, but it's, if it's just red ribbons, I mean, what, it, what are we learning, what are we taking away from it? So I sort of, at an early age, wanted to push that envelope. Um, I finally, when I went to college, I, I love seeing the Cal shirt here in the front row, because that was my alma mater. I went to Cal UC Berkeley, or it's sometimes called Cal. That wasn't planned, by the way, that's like planned. Right? Um, and I sort of settled for it, because I wanted to go to a I, you know, East Co fancy East Coast school that my sister went to, and I thought I should go to that. But I didn't, but I, I was determined to stand out. And you know, I, I actually thought that would be easy until I got there and found that I had 40,000 other students, <laughs> and it's kind of hard for anybody to stand out, um, but I noticed a, a lot was going on with the drug, drug activity, and you know, there are stereotypes about Berkeley, but I mean, there was, you know, definitely a lot of drugs going on, and it was actually in the late 90s, a time when ecstasy, especially, the raves were a big thing, I don't really think they are as much more, I don't know, maybe here they are, but in the late 90s, raves were really big, okay, it was like the whole glow stick thing, Do you even know what I'm talking about, or not? So now I'm aging myself to be the other day for everything. But anyway, the glow stick thing, you know, ecstasy, that whole dance movement was big, especially in Northern California. And kids were dying, like one a week from ecstasy. And everybody was just saying, well, they're not taking it the right way. They should have had more water than they wouldn't have died. Or they should have, and they weren't really getting to the, and I know we're laughing, but that's a real argument uh, that people even now today still use. And so I just wasn't happy with any of that. So I started a group that would sort of, uh, like, um, anyway, I, I'll make an analogy, but I started a group called Citizens for a Drug-Free Berkeley, and I know people laugh that it's kind of like the Coalition for a Wine-Free France, or, I don't know, Iowa, what are you known for? Like, yeah, I was going to say corn, but I didn't want to fill the stereotype, but okay, now that I have permission to say it, yeah, it'd be like starting Iowans for a corn-free Iowa. I mean, yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's like, you wouldn't be the most popular person uh, in school. Or in your community. And especially, I mean, signs like this were everywhere, you know, Berkeley Marijuana Initiative, you should register to vote for it to legalize, and all this kind of stuff. And, but, but what happened was, uh, I started doing this and basically not really caring, and it was called Citizens, and uh, Citizens is a plural word, I get it, but I kind of took that a little liberally, because it's usually me and kind of anyone that I could bribe, like I buy them a cheeseburger on a Friday night, you know, to work with me over the weekend. But we said Citizens. And we just did a, I, we did a lot of things that looked like it was actually about 100 people involved. It was science, it was activism. And one day, all of a sudden, I thought, you know, um, it was really hard locally for people to care. And I thought, you know, somebody in Washington, D.C. should care about this because I'm out here busting my butt trying to educate on drugs. And I don't, you know, I'm not really hearing kind of anything going on nationally. So I literally picked up the phone, and that was back in the day. I mean, it, it was actually pre-Google, but it's like, <coughs> what was the search engine? I 
anyway, it wasn't even the audio, it was something else. But I basically found the switchboard for the White House, and my friends were lucky. They were like, you're not going to get through to the White House. You can't just call the White House. 202-555-2000. Who's going to answer? And um, anyway, the, the White House operator did answer. And essentially, I said, I would like to speak to the National Drug Control Director. Now, the National Drug Control Director is the drug czar. At that time, was the youngest living four-star general. This was a guy that was on TV. I mean, the most recent drug stars haven't been on TV as much, but this was a guy that was on TV like, seemingly almost as much as President Clinton. That was President Clinton in 1997, 98. And you know, the idea that I was going to get a hold of this war hero, General Barry McCaffrey, was laughable. But uh, actually, they put me through, believe it or not. I talked to his secretary. His secretary said, General McCaffrey will call you back. He's very busy. Thought I'd never get a phone call from, from him. Yeah, you know, I just love the message. Sure enough, I got a call back almost the next day. Actually, this is him, and this is me um, a couple years later at a gala. We finally met in person. This was this was General McCaffrey, not in his army gear, but um, he did call me back, and he said, "Well, what's going on?" And I I forgot even why I had called him in the first place. I couldn't believe that he had called my door, that he had called me back. I was 18. And I said, well, you know, I think there are a lot of issues with ecstasy and marijuana in Northern California. No one seems to really care about it. Washington's very distant. I think you need to make a trip out here and look and see. Now, this is, this is me, by the way, talking to a four-star general. I think you need to take a trip out here and see what's going on. And, I mean, he was, I, I don't know, I think he was, I don't know if he was just impressed with the gall that I had to actually, you know, uh, to call him. I don't know what. But sure enough, he actually ended up coming to Northern California about six months later, which was cool. And, and then I got to meet President Clinton, too, which was also really neat. Um, I know, I'm a lot younger and a lot of other things. But anyways, uh, and um, anyway, it was, it was, the point was, by just picking up the phone and doing something that kind of seemed a little well, very crazy, actually, uh, it produced something kind of cool, actually kind of interesting. And that sort of taught me, you know, you just have to go for what you want and not really for, and who cares? So what if he didn't answer? So what if none of this ever happened? I wouldn't I've lost anything other than the two seconds it took to, you know, at that time, not Google, but whatever the search engine was, look up the number to the White House. Um, you know, then I felt like I needed something new. I felt like law school wasn't my calling. It was really hard to come to the realization that the thing that I wanted to do for 20 years, or not that, 15 years, I actually realized I didn't want to do anymore. How many of you have had that experience where something that you think you want to do or get involved in, and then you have to sort of face the music and you read, yeah, a lot of us, and you realize, you know, actually, this is the thing I was supposed to do, or everyone thought I would do, or I would always do, but, and it could be a sport, it could be anything, um, but I actually don't really like it, and I don't really want to do it. And I think it's important to figure that out as early as you can and, and not kind of delay it, because you'll face the music later. So I, I, I basically realized I wanted to get out of America, actually. I thought, yeah, I loved America, loved my country, wanted to live here, but at you know 20, I wanted to go kind of see the world and just put put pause on all this. I had done a lot of drug policy. I was in People magazine. I was on ABC News. All these things, and I was kind of done with it uh, for a little bit. I wanted to sort of see the world and sort of get a different perspective. So I did. I ended up traveling. This is just actually this is my girlfriend now, my wife, in Berlin. This is the um, the dividing line between East Berlin. And there's called Checkpoint Charlie. This is at Lake Como, which is a cool lake in Italy. My best friend, who's still my best friend, is in Denmark. Goes from Denmark, so I went to go visit his house. It's also in Italy. Um, and I learned a lot of lessons when I did. Just getting out of my normal comfort zone, in ge you know, geography-wise, like from where I was from, and even from my friends that I hung out with a long time, taught me a lot of things. First of all, uh, you know, I learned that this sort of trip in the arena has taken unexpected turns. But what I ended up learning from all these experiences, and, and I'm not going to bore you with my bio, but I ended up serving back in the Bush administration when I was 23, and then most recently in the Obama administration when I was 31, and I left a couple of years ago. But essentially, I, I learned first to follow your passions, and if you don't have them yet, <coughs> but really to carve out my own space, um, and that opportunities. I say opportunities are dynamic because they do change all the time. It does often happen to be kind of, you know, where you are at and, and, and what opportunities might be in front of you are going to be different, obviously, for everybody. And when I left the White House this last time, I realized that there was an opportunity to talk about marijuana and to talk about marijuana in a way that people hadn't heard about it before. How many of you have heard the term 
big marijuana before today. But the front row doesn't count. <laughs> You've seen me talk it yet, and some of those guys in the middle don't count either. And no, you haven't, because really it hasn't been talked about that way. But how many of you have heard Gateway? Gateway drug. How many of you have heard Just Say No? How many of you have heard, so, so you've heard those kinds. And I'm not saying those things are bad or wrong or, yeah. my point is I wanted to think about a new way to talk about an old issue and to put a new angle on it because I realized that so many people were getting caught up in, hey, marijuana is medicinal, marijuana is harmless, what's the big deal, and not really understanding the science around it. So anyway, this is just the rest of the lessons learned, which I'm sure you've read by now, but I want to I wanna get into the, um, to the marijuana. So I ended up writing a book right when I left the White House called Reef for Sanity, Seven Great Myths About Marijuana. And the, the first myth I want to, how many of you have heard the myth that marijuana is not addictive? Or is it okay? That's sad, everybody, that's true. How about marijuana is harmless, right? And so I wanted to first kind of shatter that myth because what we essentially know, what the science tells us is that if you're 16 and you try marijuana for the first time, yeah. You, you likely will not get addicted, that's true. But one out of six of you will. So it's essentially, the issue with marijuana is it's, it's essentially a game of Russian roulette. You don't know if you're one of the ones that are gonna be addicted. You don't know if you have that genetic predisposition, you have no idea. And I think what's happened in this marijuana discussion nationally is that people are getting so caught up with either, oh my God, I'm fine, I use it and I'm fine, or my parents use it and they're fine, everyone's great and it's harmless, or, Oh my God, if you use it once, you're going to use heroin. And, you, exactly. And so when you hear you're going to use a, if you use it once, you're going to use heroin tomorrow, we laugh because the 99% of people who use marijuana today will not use heroin tomorrow. And that's certainly not probably the experience of most people in here. And so we think that if that's not true, then this other thing uh, must be true. <coughs> that essentially the other thing being it's harmless and not addictive. And so the science just gets lost in this entire discussion about marijuana because um, you know it's just it's easier to say that marijuana is harmless because it's not a drug like heroin, it's not a drug like meth or cocaine. When I say that, I mean that it's not going to show the negative parts of it instantly. It's not like with meth. I mean, you know, if someone's on meth, that's it's not doesn't look great. It's nothing to write home about. Um, and the physical, you know, attributions are so graphic. Same thing with cocaine or heroin or prescription drugs. Even. With marijuana, essentially, it takes it's, it takes its time to have, it, have its toll if it's going to have that toll on it. So basically, what what I learned when I looked at the, the science and the research is that your brain and who, who's under 25 here, raise your hand. Okay, most of you. So everyone that just raised their hand. I know some of the adults tried to raise their hand, but come on. <laughs> All right. Those that did raise your hand, um, your your brain is essentially under construction, which is great. Actually, it means that um, for you to learn. A language right now is a lot easier than for me to learn a language. That's true. And, and if when you know when do you learn to talk? When you're two or when you're twenty? You learn when you're two because it's it's easier. Your brain is essentially priming and pruning. It's becoming who it is. If you wanted to learn how to play a sport now or earlier, would be the time to do it rather than later in life. Uh, when do you learn how to swim or ride a bike? Do you learn when you're five or do you learn when you're fifty? Right? It's a lot easier to learn when you're five. I mean, you can learn when you're fifty, but it's harder. And that's because your brain picks things up so much easier before it's fully mature. And your brain has matured probably about 60 to 70 percent, but it has some going to do. And essentially, when with drugs, including alcohol, of course, by the way, it's also a drug, it just happens to be legal for cultural reasons. Um, when that drug enters your brain and your bloodstream, it essentially has the potential to have much more damaging effects on the, as your brain is being built, than it would mine, someone 35 or over because my brain is, although my wife disputes this, is more or less developed. Um, but, but, but most of you, and when you're under you know, 25, your brain is still developing. And so when scientists look at adolescent brains that are using marijuana, certainly they see the susceptibility to things like addiction. Again, does addiction to marijuana look like addiction to heroin? No. You're not going to have the shakes. You're not going to have the physical violent re reactions. But you do have the reduced motivation. You do have the increased anxiety. You do have the more susceptibility to depression. It doesn't mean that everybody who uses marijuana, that's going to happen to them. It means that you're playing a game of Russian roulette. And that's sort of the message on the health harms that I try to talk about with, kind of with the science and practice. 
Um, now, the reason why, by the way, we see marijuana doing that to your, it's more likely to do it to your brain than when your parents were your age, who might have also tried marijuana. The reason they might have actually gotten away with it, frankly, is because the marijuana they smoked, I mean, unless they're like 20 years old, which I don't think they, that's physically possible. The marijuana that they smoked is about five to 10 times weaker than what you would ever get offered or you could ever buy here. Um, that's because good old, who's heard of GMO foods? Or just GMO general. Okay. Good old genetic modification, you know, it not only gives us like giant tomatoes, uh, it gives us giant marijuana, and they're literally high super strength marijuana with the THC, which is the active THC is what gets you high. The THC ingredient being manipulated by farmers, actually, by people who are growing marijuana, um, to get that high, you know, essentially to be to be more. Because you get more money, frankly, for your pot when you sell it if it's greater strength. So the reason why we're seeing the problems among much more of what your generation than mine or anyone else's in here uh, is because of the high strength THC, the higher potency stuff that was a dream, not even a dream when your parents were your age, it wasn't even possible. Um, how many of you have heard of uh, the marijuana concentrates? Like VHO, a couple of you. Well, essentially now there's a way to extract the THC into a wax. So you have over 90% THC, and that's sending people to the emergency room, that's causing all sorts of problems. They kind of call it, some people call it the crack of marijuana, um, and I don't know, I guess it's not as much here, only a couple people have heard of it, but especially on the West Coast, this has been something that is, uh, that, that is growing. But a lot of this is because of the psychoactive ingredient. I want to be mindful of time. Um, you know, I think that mental illness is actually one of the biggest issues of today's younger generation because it's something we have a very difficult time dealing with in the healthcare system. When you connect the dots between marijuana and mental illness, um, and you know, I, I don't take it from me, by the way, all of this you can look up, um, credible medical resources, uh, the American Medical Association, other groups would be good to, to look into. Um, unfortunately, when you just Google marijuana nowadays, you have websites that are frankly run by either literally drug dealers or people that are out to make money in Colorado and Washington and other states uh, manipulating the science, and that's unfortunate. But if you look up credible resources, you'll see the, the issues with mental illness that we're seeing in marijuana. I don't know. Uh, uh -oh. And then how many people think that, uh, or how many people have heard, not think, that marijuana makes you a better driver? You heard that? Yeah, some people have heard that. Or that it's not that harmful for driving. Well, marijuana actually doubles your risk of a car crash, and that's mainly because you know, people think that, well, if you're driving 30 miles an hour in a 70, that must be safer than driving like 90 in a 70. Uh, it's not. Uh, driving slower, being able to not have that depth perception, which is what marijuana affects your, your perception, um, is a huge risk on the roads, and it's the leading cause after alcohol of DUI-related um, DUI related crashes. So I think that's something that a lot of young youngsters don't understand. How many of you have heard that marijuana is medicine? Right, that it's medical. You have it. Well, essentially, uh, anybody wonder how many of you have heard that opium is medicine? One. You're, you're smart too. Well, opium is medicine, by the way. Um, opium. We have multiple, you know, all kinds of pain relievers that come from the plant opium. Would anybody in here, though, say we should smoke opium or inject heroin in our arms? to get the pain relief from things like morphine? No. What's it? Well, it would be more than hurt worse. It's not really the, the form that you would want it in, right? Yeah. And so um, we have morphine in hospitals. Morphine is the best pain reliever we know about. And that's what we're gonna, the opiates are a class of pain relief because essentially we have opiate receptors in our brain, and that means when we feel pain, we can blunt those, that feeling of pain by, by these essentially these drugs that travel to our brain and blunt those receptors. That's good. If you're, if you're having a lot of pain, you want those. You want that to be blunted. Now, of course, it's also addictive, and people die of prescription drug overdoses every day. It's a national epidemic. But if used properly, there is a role for opiates. Now, I think, actually, if used properly, there's also a role for marijuana as medicine, but it's not the marijuana you're thinking of. Just like nobody raised their hand, almost, when I asked if opium was medicine. Because we do have, oh, sorry. we do have mouth sprays and pills based on marijuana. I think that's fine. That's what science shows. 
but we don't need to smoke pot any more than you should smoke opium to get the medicinal effects. And so that's been the big disconnect in our discussion in this country. So everyone's like, well, marijuana is medical. Well, that's like saying heroin is medical. Well, heroin comes from opium, right? Or opium is medical. Well, in a sense it is, because there's a version of it that essentially is, a version that we know the dose, and we know what's in it, and all of that. With marijuana, that's happening now. There is a pill, there are other things that are coming on oils. I think those things should be promoted in science, but um, we shouldn't politicize it. And I think it has been a sort of political thing. Now, my, the last thing I want to talk about, and we're going to show the film, and then we'll take questions. You know, if you were to ask me what, what my issue with pot is, is it schizophrenia, is it the addiction thing, is it medicine? It's not any of those things. It's essentially what I talked about in the beginning, which is the, 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 the issue that right now, your generation, this only comes a few times in the matter of history, by the way. So right now it's you, you're one of the few generations going through this. You are now the primary targets of a new lobbying group, essentially. A new lobbying group that is taking its playbook from the tobacco companies. Now, you don't remember what the tobacco companies did because you were just being born when this country was waking up to the, what I would call was is a complete disaster of a hundred years of lying through their teeth that the tobacco industry did. And I, I can't discuss it uh, as well as I'm going to show it on this video right now, but essentially what we're going through is what one of my generation went through when I was you know, 15 years ago, your age, it's back up, you're now going through with marijuana. A massive industry that essentially wants to tell you marijuana is safe to hook you young so that, you're, so that you will be lifelong customers, so that you will line their pockets of profit. That is the point. So, you know, at the end of this, like I said, I want to take questions. I also want you to think, you're all leaders in your school. We actually need young leaders to be talking about these issues in their communities. We have a lot. I started an organization called SAM, which stands for Smart Approaches to Marijuana. You could look us up, learn about SAM.com. We even have an app now um, for Android and iPhone. It's only 99 cents. Um, but essentially, uh, we're about an organization. We're an organization, a volunteer organization, that's trying to raise warnings to not just your generation, but also politicians. And tonight, they're going to be representatives from the U.S. Senate's office and representatives' office, and I'm really happy about that. Um, raise the alarm and warning that we have another massive industry that's essentially here to trick today's high school generation so that they can make money. And again, our website is learnaboutsam.org. But I'm going to show this. It's only under 10-minute video, and then I think it speaks for itself, and then we'll be able to take uh, questions. Tell me if you need to raise the one. We begin with a brief history of smoking and big tobacco. In the early 1900s, smoking is a niche market. Cigarette manufacturing techniques have been invented, but demand is relatively small. But by 1915, the sales are ramping up Manufacturers use trading cards as collectibles and employ other strategies. One such strategy is targeting the military. Tobacco companies give cigarettes to troops and work with the military, urging the public to donate to cigarette funds for soldiers. The media backs the effort. The New York Times writes that cigarettes lighten the inevitable hardships of war, and another popular periodical describes cigarettes as the last and only solace of the wounded. Despite the push, not all states are for cigarettes. At one point or another, cigarettes are banned in many states, not for health reasons, but for moral reasons. In 1912, American Dr. Isaac Adler strongly suggests that lung cancer is related to smoking. In 1929, a German scientist publishes formal statistical evidence of the link between lung cancer and smoking. As concern about the health risks increases, Cigarette companies design ad campaigns with doctors. The strategy is to confuse how can something be bad if doctors say it is good. Ads state that cigarettes are good for you, good for digestion, weight loss, stress and tension relief. We begin with a niche market, with some states banning cigarette use. Health concerns are raised, but the industry pushes ahead 
marketing with doctors. It's 1950 and big tobacco is booming, one of the most profitable industries in the world. The smoking rate is nearly 4,000 cigarettes per person per year. And then, the 1952 issue of Reader's Digest, the most popular magazine in America, publishes the article, Cancer by the Carton. In reaction, the heads of the largest tobacco companies hold a secret meeting in New York's Empire State Building in December of 1953. They decide to sow doubt about the health findings of cigarettes. They pay to publish an article called A Frank Statement to Cigarette Smokers in 448 newspapers. It questions evidence that cigarettes cause cancer. They press on, marketing cigarettes as scientifically valid. They invest huge sums of money into research institutions and return for findings that cloud the cigarette health picture. They partner with candy companies to promote the concept of smoking to youth. But the facts are emerging, and in 1964, the Surgeon General announces that smoking causes lung cancer. Per capita use rates in the U.S. steadily decline after warnings, taxes, advertising bans, and public perception. But big tobacco companies keep up their strategies. In 1973, an R.J. Reynolds document reveals the long-seated emphasis on targeting teens with cigarette ads. Realistically, if our company is to survive and prosper, over the long term, we must get our share of the youth market. This is done through ads, comics, fruit-flavored cigarettes, and more. And because the youth brain can be more easily addicted to nicotine and kids make good, lifelong customers, they are invaluable targets. But of course, even as late as the 1980s, the industry denies the addictive nature of nicotine, although internal documents show strategies to increase nicotine concentrations as a means of retaining customers. Despite the death rate of lung cancer being a near-perfect correlation to smoking, and the Surgeon General stating that smoking causes cancer, there is very little success in suing the tobacco industry for 30 years. The first big win comes in 2000. So where is tobacco now? The U.S. is back to smoking levels of earlier in the 20th century, but other parts of the world are on the rise. Cigarettes are the single most traded item on the planet, with trillions being sold each year. And despite being legal, black market cigarettes are a multi-billion dollar business. For example, the majority of cigarettes sold in New York State are done so illegally. Smoking takes about 14 years off your life, causes 6 million deaths per year, the population of Atlanta each year, causes hundreds of billions in economic damage. Even after cigarette taxes, smoking is a big net loss for a country. The tobacco industry has sold 43 trillion cigarettes in the last 10 years. It spends about $20 million per year in the U.S. alone on lobbying. It is about a $35 billion industry, equal to the profits of Coke, Microsoft, and McDonald's combined, and is more profitable today than ever. Meet the next tobacco industry, marijuana. Like tobacco, big marijuana is well-organized and extremely well-funded. And like tobacco, big marijuana is using all the same strategies. Tactic one, make smoking marijuana seem good for you. Smoking tobacco was linked to lung cancer in 1929, but it took 30 years and millions of deaths to prove that smoking caused lung cancer. Marijuana is positioned as medicinal, but studies show that it negatively affects the brain. It's been linked to IQ loss, increases mental illness, and according to every single scientific body, is addictive. And for young people whose brains are still developing, marijuana has an irreversible impact. Addiction rates go way up. One in six who start marijuana use before age 18 become addicted. And for daily smokers, the risk of addiction rises to 50%. School dropout rates increase, and the risk of schizophrenia increases by 600%. Today's marijuana is not the pot of the 1960s and 70s. It's typically four times stronger and can be more than 10 times stronger. 21st century pot products have a high content of the drug's active ingredient, THC. With marijuana infused and sprayed foods, a single gummy bear can get four people high. This dab, a high potent concentrate, is produced through techniques similar to those used for crack and meth and has the potential to be highly addictive. While the pro-pot lobby presses the claim that marijuana is harmless, one in nine fatal car crashes involves marijuana use, and this statistic is rapidly rising. 
As part of the tactic, facts are continually obscured. In 2009, a pro-marijuana lobbying webpage announced the Institute of Medicine report on medical marijuana celebrates 10-year anniversary. Terms like medical marijuana and celebrates make it sound like the report praises marijuana as medicine. The comprehensive 267-page study is called Marijuana and Medicine, not Medical Marijuana. It does discuss some therapeutic benefits of THC, but clearly rejects smoking and marijuana as beneficial. It states, smoke marijuana is unlikely to be a safe medication for any chronic medical condition, and smoke marijuana is clearly harmful, especially in people with chronic conditions. It's likely that, similar to opium, marijuana may have medical utility, but also like opium, we don't need to smoke it to gain medical benefit. The American Medical Association and every major medical group in the country has come to the same conclusion. Marijuana use is a public health problem and the legalization of marijuana sales should be opposed. Tactic two, money gets things done. How much does it cost to get 20,679 physicians to praise cigarettes? How much does it cost to supply the armed forces with free cigarettes? Big Tobacco spent huge sums of money to manipulate the public, but clearly it worked as use rose almost parabolically. Where does Big Marijuana spend its money? Many people think marijuana as medicine is a movement of the people, but the finances reveal otherwise. Three extremely wealthy people have spent tens of millions of dollars to advance the legalization. But it's not just these three. A former Microsoft executive is teaming up with a former Mexican president to create a national brand, the Starbucks of marijuana. The 29-year-old Californian has raised roughly 10 million from investors to establish the Anheuser-Busch of marijuana. And we know the tobacco industry is interested. As early as the 1970s, a confidential memo written by R.J. Reynolds consultants stated the use of marijuana has important implications for the tobacco industry in terms of an alternative product line. We have the land to grow it, the machines to roll it and package it, and the distribution to market it. Today, some firms have registered trademarks which are taken directly from marijuana street jargon. Tactic three, go after youth, lifelong customers. Tobacco used candy to entice children. Marijuana uses the gummy bear, soda, ice cream, cookies, chocolate, and lots of other common name brand candy and sweet knockoffs. Dosages vary wildly on everything. These are just a few of the tactics that we already see and expect more. The marijuana industry is projected to be a $10 billion industry in four years. Is becoming a massive human experiment with potentially unfathomable consequence and is only just beginning. Early on, the cigarette industry had the public believing that cigarettes were safe, if not healthy. But with massive public use, the science could not be hidden. Today, we realize that the harms of cigarettes far outweigh the benefits. With marijuana, industry forces are again at work positioning marijuana as safe, even healthy. The science again shows many harms. What will the outcome of massive public use be? Consider again some of the harms of tobacco and marijuana. Cigarettes damage the smoker's physical health. Marijuana, on the other hand, most often impacts the user's mental and cognitive health. If we move from niche smoking to the mass use predicted by the marijuana industry, what will the impact be? We are here. The marijuana industry and its lobby wants to build and grow a multi-billion dollar legal market using all the marketing and sales strategies Big Tobacco used for a century. Let's break through the big business strategy and talk about reality. Now is the time to be informed and determine what we want for our nation, our communities, and our youth. Yeah. Uh, would you like it?
like to share from your own sort of school peer experience that I can learn from. I tend to learn as much from you, if not more, than you might learn from me. So I'd love to hear just about your experience and what you think would work to talk to teens about your own Who wants to be the brave first hand to either ask a question or share a comment? And if you're stretching because you were yawning, I'm going to pretend that that was a question. There you go. And if you can just say your name and grade. My name is Cassie Rupert. I'm a sophomore. And I was wondering just um, why the distribution of marijuana is becoming so popular, even though it's illegal while tobacco is. You tell me. No, I, I mean, I think that it's because people think it's relatively harmless. If you think about it, tobacco is legal. I mean, cigarettes, you can buy for 18 year old. And yet, the societal sort of stigma against cigarettes, I think, is greater than the societal stigma against marijuana, which gets to the heart of your question. Why is that the case? I just think it's been completely legitimized over the last 30 years, and it started really with medical. I mean, think about it, people. Um, you know, if you're if you're the stereotypical stoner, it's like the lazy guy who's living with his mom at age 40 and like still mom goes for him. That sort of you know nobody has a lot of sympathy for that person. But if you can change the stereotypical stoner to go from that guy to the 80 year old dying of cancer, right? Or, or I know you've had the discussion about kids with epilepsy, right, in Iowa. So if you can change that from a political point of view from the stoner that nobody cares about to the two-year-old with 60 seizures a day will break your heart, you're gonna go pretty far politically. So I frankly think that this has been a really smart political strategy among the people who stand to make money from this, who have said, we gotta change the image. Let's talk about medical, how this is really good for you, for kids and old people and all that, because who's gonna vote against an 85-year-old granny or a two-year-old with seizures? Nobody. So if you're able to do that, then you can eventually get people to come on your side. You know, psychologists, anybody, I don't know if you're all interested in psychology, but uh, psychologists, some of you are good. Psychologists talk about the thing that we all have in our heads called permission structure. What that means is, essentially, in everything that you like or dislike, you, you, you don't realize that you unconsciously give yourself permission to be okay with the implications of liking it or not liking it. So with marijuana, what a lot of people were like, I don't, I don't like marijuana, I don't use it, it's weird. But what gave them the permission to now be okay with it is this whole thing on medical. It's like, oh, well, okay, if it's about the dying kid or the dying grandma, then I guess I'm okay with it. And over time, that is, I think, had a lot, that's eroded. And, and it's had a lot of uh, prominence. I'd actually like to hear from a, just an honest raising of hands. How many people here think that your own peer, either you or your peers, basically people around you, think that smoking marijuana is harmful? Like how many, raise your hand if your peers, if the, if the majority, let's say, of your friends or your peers think marijuana is actually bad for you. To be honest, it's probably, that's about mm, less than a, I less than a quarter. That means 75% of you have, you think that your peers think marijuana is not a big deal. Raise your hand if, if you or your peers think that smoking cigarettes is worse for you than smoking marijuana. Yeah, almost everybody. Now, I hate the comparison real quick, and then I want to ask more questions, but I hate the question, I mean the comparison between the different, like what's worse, pot or cigarettes, or pot or alcohol. And I ask that just to get your response, but I don't like the comparison because if they're apples and oranges, you know, as we mentioned in the film, Cigarettes, yes, they kill half a million people a year because of your lungs. But you can drive and smoke a cigarette, right? I'm not telling you to do that, okay? So don't no, think that I'm telling you to do it. But the point of me saying that is cigarettes don't get you high, right? Marijuana affects your mind. It affects your brain in that way. Cigarettes, you can go to work and with a cigarette in from your mouth, you'll probably be fired because you're not allowed to smoke indoors. But you're gonna, it, it's going to hurt you because you're fired. It's not going to hurt you because you're getting high from a cigarette. Right? Um, and so the harms are different. And I know a lot of people like to compare beer and marijuana too. And really, I, I think at, at your age, it's, again, these are false comparisons. It's sort of like asking you, okay, raise your hand, what's worse? Jumping out of the fourth floor building, seventh floor building, or ninth floor building? They're all kind of, kind of not ninth. The answer, by the way, isn't ninth floor. <laughs> the answer is like all of the above are things you don't want to do. <laughs> you should question. 
question, the premise of the, the premise of my question. So, so the premise of, now yes, you might be more likely to survive, right? Uh, fourth floor, the ninth floor, yes, that's true. And that's why the comparison holds. But they're all stupid choices. They're, I mean, it's true. They're, why would you want to do any of that? If somebody said, well, let's say, for which one do you want to do? Choose. The answer is, I'm getting out of it. I'm not going to get it. And I think with, with marijuana, cigarettes, and alcohol, we sometimes <laughs> give it this weird hierarchy that isn't really based in reality. Yeah, please, more questions or comments. Yeah. Yeah. Totally depends on your question, because I'll have to say mine. Go ahead. Um, Isaac, a sophomore. I mean, when you have enough common sense to smoke marijuana to know that if you drive, you will get in a car accident. You would hope that people would have common sense to know that, but uh, according to a survey last year, 17% of high school seniors, so they're supposed to be the smart ones, right? High school seniors uh, uh, say that they, <laughs> no, they're not. I don't think there are any seniors in uh, say that they have gotten into a car or they themselves have driven while by they don't think it's a problem. So that's almost one in five. And that's because of this perception again that like smoking's gonna kill you tomorrow, but smoking pot is um, it's wrong. You're gonna smoke, smoke. Put it in the microphone. If you're gonna smoke, smoke say yeah, obviously if you're gonna smoke, don't get into a car, but uh, the, the the problem is it's not just getting into a car that's the problem with smoking. But yes, obviously, if that's happening, you don't want to encourage anybody to drive. Yes? Um, my name is Ryan Hall. Um, I'm a freshman. Um, like so you must be the smartest one here, because I won't think seniors are <laughs> Freshmen, too. Well, I'm just sorry, seniors. It was there. They said it, not me. I didn't say it. Go ahead. Like, why are like, like, companies trying to put like, their in like, their food? Why they wouldn't food? Because would you, if let's say you're 13 years old, are you going to be more likely to grab a really weird looking cigarette blunt thing that you have no idea how to light it? Or are you going to be willing to grab what looks like a cherry gummy bear? By the way, who doesn't like gummy bears in here? Is it like one? Yeah. <laughs> Two, three. Okay, how about who doesn't like gummy bears, chocolates, cookies, or brownies? So you're probably the most healthy person in the room. Hey, yeah. I didn't follow your diet. But anyway, the vast majority of people do. And especially if you're young, you do. So what is they get attracted to kids? Why did tobacco companies for 50 years make candy cigarettes? Have any of you seen those, by the way? Do they still even have they, they actually have them? Yeah. Well, they have them, and I, I remember being like 11 years old and wanting them. I thought they were really fun. I, remember you, I don't know what you do now, but you used to blow out this gum, and it would blow it would look like smoke. I mean, might have been still age, but anyway, that's how they used to be. And, um, and, and so when you wanted to emulate what was going on, like what you thought looks like, you know, I think the best advertisement for, for drinking, like if a, if, a, if a company wants someone to drink, they should do what I, I think Miller used to do, I don't know if they still do this, where basically it says like, you know, it says like, you know, off limits until you're 21. I mean, that's the best advertisement to get any 17 year old to say, well, I'm drinking now. Because if this is going to make me an adult, if this is a badge of adulthood, I want it. And that's what we're seeing right now with all these marijuana products. So I just think it's a lot easier to use, and that's why they target. Do you have a follow-up question? Yeah. Go ahead. Like for like, if they're using the same ideas that they use back right. then to tobacco, like who's gonna be like? Why are they still falling for it when they know like it was bad? That's the million-dollar question. That's why I'm here. Why are people falling for it? Because I hate to break it to you, but we have Americans have bad. It's streamer, please read your history book. It will repeat itself ten times in your lifetime, whether it's whatever it's that issue it is. And we, and we unfortunately, listen, this is, people might go to China now for manufacturing, but they still come to the US for advertising and promotion. We are the kings of the world when it comes to PR. That this is you come to America to advertise and to promote something. That's our capitalist side of how it is. And that's mainly benefited us as a country, right? We get all these great things because, you know, we we can sell them much better than most other countries. That's a good thing normally. But it can, the flip side of that is when it comes to these sort of products. By the way, no other country in the world has even gotten close to doing what we're doing, in the way we're doing it here with marijuana. So everyone's kind of watching us, saying, "Wow, what's going to happen?" And I, I just want to more thing. And I think that it also has implications for all of you. Frankly, when you're out in the, in the
competitive workforce. Okay, and I don't mean to, but you're, you are competing against many more people than I have competed against. Millions of people that are just as smart, just involved in just as many clubs as you are from around the world. You're competing for those spots in college. You're competing for those jobs with them. And my message to lawmakers who say, on the one hand, we want to raise education standards and we want to give you job opportunities in America, we also want to legalize marijuana. My message to them is, you know, good luck with that. It's a totally contradictory message because I can guarantee you that the people you're competing for jobs with on the global economy, they don't have nearly the number of marijuana users that we do, or really any drug. And so we lead the world on prescription drug opiate deaths, marijuana, meth, cocaine, all of those things. And it's sort of like politicians are saying, good luck, good luck, you know, we'll, we have, this is the worst time to be in the economy, good luck with your future, but we're going to legalize marijuana. It just, it makes no sense, and that's why we need actually young people like you all to be speaking out on these issues. I will tell you, elected officials will listen to all of you a hundred times more than they'll listen to me or anyone else. It's important to hear your voice. Yes? You set up my simulated question, and that's legalizing marijuana. My question is, why focus on whether it's legalized? When we're trying to legalize it, obviously, but it's still evident. So, like, why is the focus of, on legalizing it or not? Instead Rather than just talking about the harms. Right, exactly. no, right. Well, I, that's a good, why is my focus, or why is the society the society? Well, because I think when the focus is on le why to legalize, it's because there is money to be made. There's no other reason. And some people say the reason to legalize is so we can get people out of prison because we have a racist criminal justice system. And if we only legalize marijuana, that would eliminate that. So listen, I don't want to put people who smoke a joint in prison. Okay, I'm the first one to say, if you're caught with a joint, especially if you're underage, you should not go to jail or prison. Um, but the answer, so the answer to not going to jail or prison is simply that. It's not going to jail or prison. It's not, oh, we don't want you to go to prison, so we're going to legalize. But that's how the argument is. So a lot of people who don't want, you know, you're saying, why are people falling for this? Much? Because it's not framed like this to people. None of you have heard of this before. So that's, that's my point. Most people think that it, this is about getting people out of prison and, you know, getting rid of a disastrous war on drugs and give the cops have too much power and we just need to, like, get people out of prison for smoking. <laughs> they don't realize it has to do with this. I think if they did realize it had to do with this, then we wouldn't have the discussion so much. And people would say, oh yeah, we don't, we don't want to go through that again. Let's talk about how to reduce the harms. Uh, but it's really hard because the prevention training, <coughs> your advisors, the people at your school, your principals, they're, they're having to play a dual role right now. They're playing the dual role that you just mentioned. Trying to abolish it, right? Get rid of it, or at least reduce the use among young people. And worrying about all of these policies that essentially are, you know, lining the pockets of these companies. So they kind of have to worry about two things, which I think is very important. Yeah. I'm Kayla, and I'm a senior, and uh -oh. also, yeah. Just kidding. Um, and I actually have never heard any of like the myths you were talking about, the, the faults of them, and I was just wondering like why they haven't had any like anti-commercials or anything, because it's more, I bet like a lot more people, if it like, they talked about more IQ and like ruining like your mind. I feel like a lot more people would stop because. Well, we don't because you know again the government just doesn't focus so much on. And you by the way you should ask these are uh, awesome questions. I really wish you would ask your elected officials all these questions because they need to hear them from you. So that's just the first thing I'm going to say. But um, the government hasn't funded really anti. Anybody seen an anti-drug commercial? I mean there hasn't been there's. There are some, the partnership does some, the state does some, um, but, uh, and we have some years in partnership for Rotary Iowa here. Uh, but, you know, in general, they don't fund these ads like they used to. And even when, so those of you interested in advertising and PR, you know that there's earned media and paid media, right? Paid media is what you're talking about. I'm gonna pay a station a million bucks to show a TV commercial against drugs. That's normal. Earned media is when get a store, the Des Moines Register, right, comes to you and says, you know, uh, what is this ad about? We're going to we're, we're gonna talk about the ad. You, you get press basically that way, and it's earned media, free media. Um, whenever that happens on these studies, like IQ, there are a hundred responses, when I say hundred, I mean like hundred thousand responses online and other people from 
the groups that want to legalize questioning everything, just like they questioned the tobacco link to cancer for 100 years. You guys, we knew since 1910 that tobacco caused cancer. The government didn't admit it until 1964, and the industry didn't admit it until there was a gun basically in their head. In 1999, we admitted it to Congress. 1999. So that took 87 years for society to say, oh, that's what the research said. Okay, no one can dispute it. All this research about IQ and all this stuff is new. It's a, oh, much of it is less than 10 years old. So we're almost going through that same learning period of denial and people questioning and funding their own. And what my worry is, we're going to go down this path of legalization, cause all this harm, and in 100 years, do what we just did with tobacco, which is basically, oh, whoops, it was bad. Sorry, didn't mean to. And we're kind of going through that same thing again. So I hope we don't. And I don't think it, this is inevitable, so don't get me wrong, I'm not giving you a message that we've lost because these big companies are out there. I, I think, honestly, with all of you, talking to your friends, your parents, parents need to be, and your neighbors, adults need to be educated the most on this stuff. We can actually make a difference, but it's it's going to take a while, but it's going to take all of you. Yeah? Hi, I'm Isabel Weber. Um, I'm in 11th grade, I'm a junior. And I was just wondering what your opinion was on decriminalizing drugs, because if someone's addicted to a drug, it's not really fair to just throw them in prison, because that doesn't really help. It's a very intelligent question. So the question was about decriminalization. And, you know, I don't use that term, because most people are not as smart as you, or this, honestly, or the rest of this group. And what I think, she said is, that's true. Uh, no, <laughs> no but, but really, and, and <laughs> that's because Everybody confuses these terms. Again, if you're studying journalism or politics or whatever, the, for one of the first things to know is that any terms used are going to mean a million different things to a million different people. So that, I know what you just meant when you said decriminalization because of the way you framed the question, but 99% of the way, that, for example, that word gets used in the media is wrong. <laughs> they interchange it with legalization. They interchange it with what you just saw. What I think you meant, correct me if I'm wrong, is Let's not put somebody in jail or prison, criminalize them if they're addicted to any drug, right? If they're addicted to heroin or cocaine. And I, and I agree with that. We shouldn't put them in prison if they're addicted to cocaine or heroin. And I don't know anybody, even law enforcement, who thinks that people should be just rotting away in prison if their only crime is being addicted to heroin or cocaine. I think everybody thinks they should get treatment. Now, the issue, though, is, what was your name again? Isabel. Isabel. The issue is, though, it's not always so black and white. It's not like, you have addicts, and you have people who don't use and aren't addicts. And if you're an addict, you go to jail, or if an addict, you don't. It's not like that. Because if it was, we could just say, oh, you're an addict, good, you shouldn't go to jail, fine. The problem is, it's, I committed robbery, burglary, and attempted murder, oh, and I'm an addict. Or, well, not, not all the time, but a lot of the time. Or, I shoplifted, and I'm an addict. Or, I was involved in child abuse, and I'm an addict. So, or, I got into a drunk driving accident. I killed three people, but I'm addicted to alcohol. Now, what do you say to that person? Do you say, oh, you're addicted, so we're going to forget about the fact that you killed three people and broke the law, and we're just going to get you treatment? Yeah. That doesn't make sense for most people. What you would say is, well, you need some punishment, because you killed three people, or attempted to kill three people, even if that didn't happen with your car, even if it was an accident, it was negligent. And so, you have to be punished for that. But we want to give you treatment while you're in prison or jail, or we want to make sure that when you go back to the community after you serve your time, you're healthy, that you're not addicted anymore, or at least there's a path to follow. And so I think in our criminal justice system, we need to invest much more in treatment in the system because, again, a lot of these people who are addicts and they've been arrested an average of 17 times, they're not just perfect angels who happen to also be addicted to heroin. They were committing crimes at the same time. You need to treat both issues. So, do you have, did you want to respond to that at all? Um, kind of. Okay, okay. So, what if someone is just charged with like possession? Like, let's say someone was charged with just possession of heroin, and they didn't have any other charges. Yeah. And then, so yeah, does no, that I mean they should person. just go get treatment, or should they? Well, just I don't think everybody who's charged. Like, this is how complicated drug addiction is. You all know. It's not that everybody who ever uses anything needs treatment. That's also maybe a waste of treatment. You don't want to give treatment to somebody who maybe just used marijuana for the first time and not addicted. So everything depends on the context of the person. It should, my thing is, it shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all. In general, I prefer treatment, but I also realize that you need to punish sometimes, too, because there are crimes that are being committed. Okay, thank you.
we have time for two more questions. It's good, I don't know. I don't know. I'm Bree Mervet and I'm a sophomore. And my question is, is like, why is only some states have to legalize marijuana and not every state? Good question. Well, because in our why the question is why are only some states legalized and not all? Well, first of all, only two have. Two more are going to vote on in November, and I think it's a lot going to be a lot harder to get it through. But this is, and this may be controversial for me to say, but you guys are mature enough. This is not like same-sex marriage. Okay, people thought, oh my God, nobody wanted gay marriage ten years ago, but now everybody does, and it's sweeping the nation, and there's no turning back. And it, it, legalization is just like gay marriage; like it's going to start small. And happen. I think that they're very different, different, very, very different issues. I don't think at all that the legalization issue is going to follow the trajectory of same-sex marriage, um, mainly because people have very strong views about same-sex marriage for or against, right? It's religious, against, easily, or moral, or if you're for, it's because your family member is, and you think it's okay, or whatever. Whereas with marijuana, the public opinion is, it's not like everyone's like, whoa, we want to legalize so we can all smoke pot. Remember, I didn't talk about this, only 7% of Americans use marijuana regularly. That's, you know how many more people smoke cigarettes for all the, you know, thinking that nobody smokes anymore? Three times as many people smoke cigarettes, and seven times as many people drink, or eight times as many people drink. So it's not that everybody who wants to legalize, and even in Colorado who voted for it, is like, yes, I voted for it so I could use pops. No, they're voting for it because of the issues that Isabel uh, brought up. Isabel, Lester, Isabel, sorry. Sorry, Isabel. Brought up, I got it right the first time. Of criminalization. They're like, I don't think people should go to jail, so we should legalize. That's why they're voting for it. So that's another little you know, interesting thing if you're interested in political science to look at public opinion is to delve deep. Why do people think the way they do? And so if people want to legalize because they don't want people to go to prison, if you're able to solve the problem of what I talked about, not going to prison and doing other things, then I think the support for legalization fades away. Because when people see marijuana gummy bears, how many people think that your parents would be okay with marijuana gummy bears being sold in stores? And most people, like, okay, some of you can perhaps be okay, I won't ask questions, but most of you, probably not. And um, that's not what Americans think about when they think of marijuana legalism. They don't think like, yes, we're going to have cookies and marijuana Hershey bars and stuff. They don't want that, but it's happening. So I think it's going to leave a bitter taste in a lot of people's mouths. And I actually think that this whole thing is going to fall apart in five to ten years. I hope I'm right, it could be wrong. But, uh, and in 10 years, you might be thinking, oh my god, that lame guy who we saw at the library was totally wrong. So we just legalized pot nationwide. Maybe. But I, I think that generally, it's going to fade away. I think it's kind of a fad. And it's only happening state by state because that's easier politically to do. It's much harder to pass a federal law. It's much easier to go into a state like Colorado, throw $4 million bucks and, and pass them. Folks, if you had $5 million, $4 million bucks, I can name 15 states where you can pass, you know, no bathing on Sunday's law, and you probably pass it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sorry to say that. Sometimes our democracy is corrupted by money. And I think that's the case here with marijuana, is the people with the money are getting the message out. And the message sounds great. We need to pop for cancer for kids. It's hard to counter that without money. Yes? Last question. Last question. I'm Skyler, and I'm a freshman. Yeah. With all the movies like these days that are pro marijuana, I mean, you know, look, I like a lot of the same comedians and probably movies that <laughs> my, my wife thinks that my brain is still developing, so I probably like a lot of the same things you guys do. But, um, you know, at the same time, I think, I think it's a very fine line to just make light of using any substance. Remember, we used to have smoking in almost every television show or movie that was ever produced. Pre-1990, okay. you would find at least a cigarette in one every single movie or TV series at some point. You never did. When's the last time any of you remember even seeing a cigarette on TV recently? No, I mean it's gone. And I think that's society's way of saying, you know, these things are cancer sticks. They kill half a million people a year. We do. We were lied about them for a hundred years. We don't want them in our society anymore. And we're at the point in society where there's a lot of stigma against smoking. Like I said earlier in the first question. We're the opposite for marijuana right now. We're at the point where everyone thinks it's great. 
We're like the look, we're like the high point, right? Of like just everyone thinking it's no big deal. Which again, Newton's law. I think what comes up must come down. That's why I think this is going to fade away. I think people are going to say this isn't what we thought. And support is going to fade away. But right now we're here, so it's easy to make fun of it. It's easy to make light of it. Um, and I don't know. What do I say about it? I wish those weren't those jokes weren't made. I kind of cringe when I watch um, certain actors that I actually think are really funny make a lot of like pop jokes because I know people that are struggling with marijuana addiction. I know families that have spent three hundred thousand at last count three hundred seven thousand nine hundred ten dollars of somebody's college and medic medical school fund that they thought was going to go to college medical school for marijuana treatment for their now twenty two year old who's been struggling for five years. So when I think of that person and I think of the heartache that that family who thought pop was harmless until it cost them almost half a million dollars. Um, when I think about what they're going through, if I think that they, those people who are going through hell every day are going to see, what's his name, I can't remember, but you know, one of these guys making fun of marijuana in a movie, I, I think, yeah, Seth Rogen is right, and others, I think like, well, you know, I think that that's like, not good. So I'm not, I'm not a fan of that, and I think that eventually it's going to go away. I'm also not, you know, totally stiff. I understand some people are going to find it funny, but I just think overall, just like cigarettes had a bad, it was not net good for society to have so much smoking. <coughs> I think the same thing with smoking marijuana. So, I don't know if you guys learned anything today. I certainly did from a lot of your answers, and I always get a lot from these discussions. But I'm just going to leave my, this is all the rest. I'm going to leave my uh, <coughs> email here. This is my email, Kevin at nerd.sam.org. That's the website. And I also have my own Twitter at Kevin Sabet. Uh, so, I just want to thank you all for